spin on X. Similar X promotes cross disciplinary exchanges with uh, non technical but in depth talks and discussions. It is a great pleasure today to have Professor Chen Yuan Zhong from the chemistry department of NTU uh, to give us the seminar. Professor Chen got his uh, master, uh, bachelor and master degrees from NTU, the chemistry department, and his PhD from MIT. Then after three years of a postdoc term at Berkeley, he joined the faculty of uh, NTU, the chemistry department in year 2006. Professor Chen works across the boundary between chemistry and the physics. He's an expert on applying quantum mechanics to advanced materials and energy applications. Today he's going to uh, talk about quantum jungle in the biological world, how quantum mechanics comes to the comes to the end of photosynthesis. Professor Chen. Thank you very much. And, uh, wow. <laughs> okay. So uh, when I was first contacted by Professor Chen to give this seminar X talk to a group of uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm supposed to give a non-technical talk to a group of physicists and uh, not only there will be a question and answers, there will be a uh, how, how do panel, discussion. panel discussion after this to uh, get me right, maybe, <laughs> okay. Initially I was quite hesitated, it's, that would be a total uh, challenge, but then I think about this. Uh, maybe it's a quite interesting opportunity to um, talk to you about something that I really feel very excited. Okay, so the title is Quantum Jungle in the Biological World, How Quantum Mechanics Come to the Aid of Photosynthesis. Of course, the focal point of this will be uh, our uh, un understanding of our, what we just learned, just beginning to learn about uh, quantum effects in photosynthetic systems. Now, think about this. This is a picture of, of course, a jungle. Okay. And when you, look at, when you look at this, you imagine very noisy uh, environment, lots of uh, various lab phones um, thriving in this place. And all of it, all of it, due to a very important process on Earth, that's photosynthesis. Photosynthetic systems such like the plants you just see in the jungle produce oxygen and chemical energy for all sorts of life forms that basically sustains everything, every life form on Earth. I would say this is probably the most important photochemical process on Earth. And, uh, Collecting sunlight energy with high efficiency is not trivial at all. Think about what we are trying to do right now. Okay, a huge part of energy application or the energy research is trying to get uh, efficient uh, photovoltaic, for example, but it's not easy. Okay. And still, after many, many, many decades of research, we still have much to learn about this very important process. So my plan here is, first of all, in give a short introduction, introduction to the process called photosynthetic light harvesting. And uh, some very limited theoretical background, I basically remove all the equations, but <laughs> forgive me. Okay, I have to leave a little bit over there. Then I'll talk about an example that demonstrates the how a uh, material system basically use quantum coherence effect to uh, improve or to, to, to get efficient uh, uh, light harvesting. Then I'll talk about a little bit about actually what we are currently doing and uh, give you a flavor of uh, what kind of research is being carried out in my research group uh, recently. Now, first part. So if you think about photosynthesis, it's really a very re remarkable process. This is a uh, kind of an uh, uh, age of uh, Earth, and this is plugged with uh, oxygen levels in atm atmosphere. Okay. So first photosynthetic cells, bacteria actually, bacteria, 
appeared around uh, 2.6 billion years ago. Okay. That's all from a very, very long evolution. Finally, there is some simple life form occupied Earth. Finally. And then water splitting photosynthesis appears around here 2 billion years ago. But then something drastic happened because of uh, the uh, aerobic photosynthesis, oxygen began to accumulate on Earth. And that allows uh, our uh, res respiration using oxygen as a very efficient energy source. Okay. And then all sorts of life forms started to be possible and thrive on Earth. Okay. So this is very important. It transformed the Earth. <coughs> now, if you think about this in terms of the efficiency of the the photosynthetic system itself, it has billions of years of evolution. And we thought that the system, the efficiency of this process has been optimized to a certain point. Okay. Now, you probably all saw this picture before. It uh, uh, appears in the popular literature for global warming quite uh, frequently. You probably see it over there. So this is the uh, years and uh, how carbon dioxide accumulates okay, in the atmosphere. Now, instead of looking at this average trend, I want you to take a look at this oscillating kind of, kind of periodic change of uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It actually reached a top around April, and then this is on the uh, uh, north hemi hemisphere, okay? top here, carbon dioxide, and then gradually, gradually decreases and get it to a low point at October, and then go again every year, every year, like this, <coughs> globally. Why is that? That's due to photosynthesis. So the carbon dioxide, when summer came, all the plants, everything started to warm up, and uh, actively convert carbon dioxide into sugar. So carbon, the amount of carbon dioxide decreases. And then in the winter, all the leaves fall, okay? Minimum amount of photosynthesis. And now carbon dioxide accumulates again. Okay. I would say that there's basically no other process on Earth that would be able to produce such kind of uh, annually, very fast, global uh, change. Yeah. And if you look at the, this is a picture that depicts the amount of chlorophylls. So density of chlorophyll, chlorophyll is the most important photosynthetic uh, pigment on Earth. Over here, and, and you see this green, the uh, high density chlorophylls, meaning there's lots of photosynthesis over there. Okay. And not only on the land, lands in the ocean, there's a lot of photosynthetic activities. This process globally converts 100 billion pounds of carbon into sugar from carbon dioxide. Okay. This is a very, very large number. Okay. I don't know how to weight 100 billion pounds of any, any. Okay. And actually, half of it occurs in our ocean. So marine life actually uh, does a lot of photosynthesis. I want to use those slides to show you that this process in such a scale is actually a very remarkable feat that plants and all sorts of uh, photosynthetic organisms are able to carry out this kind of, uh, you know, really basically transform the Earth. Now, you are all familiar with the basic idea of photosynthesis as of sunlight and uh, through carving circle uh, convert carbon dioxide into sugar. And uh, what I'm really interested in here and I want to share with you is this very first part, converting sunlight 
into some form of a chemical potential. This is called the light reaction. The light reaction. So, what do you need to do if you want to, you know, convert light energy? The first thing you need to be able to absorb energy from sunlight. This is a solar spectrum. Okay, it, the radiation versus the wavelengths. Okay, here the peak. The major part of it is in the visible uh, range. And that's basically why we develop uh, eyes sensitive to this range of light. So first thing, we need to have a pigment molecules that can absorb sunlight. And in photosynthetic system, they evolve many, many different kinds of molecules to do this. Most important ones are chlorophylls, there are uh, coronoids, and uh, phycocyanin sort of stuff. I'll introduce you to those molecules. This is chlorophyll A, chlorophyll, uh, bacteria chlorophyll, and the chlorophyll B. They have, uh, they have different substituents at this position, and this position here. So chlorophyll is basically a ring structure with magnesium in the center, okay? That basically stabilizes this uh, ring-like uh, molecule. And a long vital chain, a tail here. And this pi conjugate system in this ring basically is responsible for the adoption of sunlight. Now, another one is coronoids. Those are basically long conjugated polyenes, okay, with various numbers of uh, conjugations. So this is a decopin. And so they show different colors. Uh, this is phycocyanin and uh, phycoethylene. So they are basically him, but if you break down here, so now you, this him is a ring, okay? And it's basically is the uh, pigment responsible for carrying oxygen in our blood. So it's very common in, uh, in, in, in biological systems. And you break one, this bond here and you become a, you open this ring. And that's basically the structure of this two. Now, if you put the, the absorption spectrum of all those uh, pigments together, you see that this is across the uh, visible range, coffee A, coffee B, corn noise, okay, and uh, phycoethylene, phycocyanin, coffee of, this is q band of coffee Clearly, they occupy, they basically cover all the spectrum, and basically each different Photosynthetic organism has their own uh, kind of a niche for absorption sunlight. Okay, those live in the bottom of the forest. They tend to use this sort of uh, pigments so that when those trees absorb this light, they still got some green light to use. Very interesting. This is all made possible by uh, river, uh, evolution. And those pigments are actually fixed by proteins to form so-called pigment protein complexes. So proteins will use their uh, residue to bind, uh, for example, in this case, the chlorophylls and fix those chlorophylls rigid in space. Okay. So here you see a chlorophyll. This is chlorophyll molecule uh, fixed inside this uh, protein complex. And this is a chrono over here. Those are called light housing complex. They are responsible for absorption, absor absorbing sunlight and then transfer this light energy to reaction center to perform uh, photosynthesis. The general picture can be depicted by this picture here. So if you imagine each of those disks are a complex like this, so there are many, many of those disks form so-called antenna. They are responsible for absorb sunlight, collect all those light, en light energy funnel them into a specific site called reaction center to induce an electron transfer. And this electron transfer produce chemical potential that will be used for the dark reactions. Okay. And what's remarkable here is this process has a very high quantum yield, near unity, generally more than 90%. Now, this is an example, probably the most studied photosynthetic uh, organism is the purple bacteria. And this is a picture of those purple bacteria uh, underneath this uh, microscope. Now, physicists, this is really done by physicists. 
use air fan to very carefully put those membrane under air fan and look at them. And after, so this is a kind of a rough uh, image of that membrane. And after uh, enhanced resolution technique, they were able to produce this picture. You clearly see small rings, large rings, and something stuck inside those large rings. And we know what they are because we actually have uh, crystal structures of those uh, comp complexes. Small rings are L LH2 complexes. Larger rings are LH1 and relation center in the center. The picture on the right is actually depicted from the crystal structures of those, of those uh, pigment protein complexes, lyophysin complexes. LH1, LH, uh, LH1, LH2, and relation center. And through years of accumulating data and study, we actually know quite uh, well how energy moves through this uh, photosynthetic membrane. For example, we know that in BA50 ring, the energy transfer is very rapid, 100 to 200 nanoseconds. And the inter-ring B800 to BA50 transfer is also very fast, uh, around uh, one picosecond. Even LH2 to LH1, 3 picosecond, LH1 to the reaction center, 35 picosecond. Those are ultra fast processes. And that's necessary because when chlorophyll absorbs sunlight, it goes to excited state. And this excited state can emit a photon and go back to ground state, and then you lose the light energy. This radia rad radiation uh, decay, the fluorescence decay, is around the time scale of one nanosecond. So the energy transfer, energy absorbed from here and gets to the radiation center must beat the time scale of uh, fluorescence. Okay. It must be much faster than one nanosecond. Otherwise, that energy is lost. So those alpha fast uh, energy, excitation energy transfer processes are responsible for this high quantum yield in those uh, photosynthetic systems. And not just this. Okay, this membrane actually forms a huge vesicle like this. Okay, those are actually a research from uh, actually Carl Sutton's group. They use crystal structure to stack and build this vesicle structure and be able to locate position of various kinds of protein complexes in there. Okay, and this structure actually is this white spots is probably not very clear, but if you look at this very carefully, you can see white spots over there. Okay. So the true photosynthesis apparatus might look like this. Now this is another photosynthetic complex, but this one looks very, very different from the, this very beautiful ring light LH2. Okay. So photosynthetic organisms utilize various types of uh, light harvesting complexes to achieve the same single goal of a very efficient energy transfer. This is called light harvesting complex two. It's the major light harvesting complex on Earth, and basically the major light harvesting complex in green plants. If you look at a leaf, it's green, it's due to this complex. It's probably the most important light harvesting complex on Earth because half of the chlorophylls are actually found in this complex. It contains uh, 42 chlorophylls many, many chlorophylls in here, densely packed in a, well, I don't know, maybe no structure, maybe there's structure. That's something still a, a subject of research. This is the engine of photosynthesis in higher plants. It's called the Photosystem two core complex. The D1, D2 complex here is the reaction center that are responsible for charge separation and use that charge to generate oxygen. PS2 is the site of oxygen evolution. And those are kind of uh, uh, accessory uh, light harvesting complexes. It contains 64 chlorophylls. In this system, actually, the LHC2 and core complex, they actually assemble together on the membrane, on the membrane to form a so-called super complex. And this is a real functional unit for photosynthesis, the light reaction in uh, plants or some cyanobacteria, okay, this part. And the outside are those uh, antennas and these are core complex and duration centers sitting here. 
And in this picture, we will see this, how this might happen. So a um, compass in antenna might absorb sunlight and transfer that energy to a radiation center to perform photosynthesis. And that energy sometimes might transfer to another uh, radiation center. Okay. And again, performs photosynthesis. And I think what's key or what's remarkable here is really in the PS2 supercomputers, there are hundreds, 200 to 300 uh, core fields. And those core fields bounded by those photosynthesis, lighthouse encompasses, they are able to cooperate and uh, deliver excitation energy across 10 to 20 nanometers, so quite long range microscopically, to a specific site with, with near unity uh, corner efficiency. And we want to know. Why, how is that possible, or, or is that something uh, uh, we can learn and apply to artificial uh, energy materials? Now, in the past few years, there is sort of uh, very interesting development in this field. A uh, conventional paradigm for photosynthesis is just like the picture I, sh I showed you. So, energy absorbed and then energy hopped from one side to the other side, eventually to radiation center. Kind of do performing a random walk to find the radiation center. And maybe sometimes a fun of random walk. But nonetheless, random walk is not very complex. Okay. But recently there is uh, some evidence, or I would say evidence, that corner effect in forces and lighthouse are important. Okay. So we, of course, must define corner effect. A little bit. Every time, every time you see quantum versus clash call, and you need to define things clearly first. Otherwise, it will become some sort of semantic. We are not answering any questions. I would say there are some trivial quantum effect that chemical bound. You need quantum mechanics to have a chemical bonding, right? Uh, you have a quantized energy level, so your absorption from ground state to expanded state uh, are quantized. Those are quantum. You have unit uh, poly scrutiny principle for your spin statistics and so on and so forth. I would say those are trivial quantum effects. Those are not quantum effects I, that I am going to talk about. The essence of quantum uh, here should be quantum coherence or quantum superposition. When we talk about superposition in this context of uh, excitation energy, uh, you can mean two different things. First one is a coherent delocalization of excitations. So if, imagine that we have two molecules, if their energy are close to each other and they have coupling with each other, then a laser pulse of absor absorption of sunlight can actually excite both of them at the same time. You, the real energy eigenstate is a superposition state of the two excitations. So they are not localized, they are delocalized. This so-called acetones are some sort of a quantum object here, yeah, energy delocalized. There's another type of quantum is, uh, effect is coherent time evolution of dynamics that shows quantum fits at, uh, at whatever you are absorbing. So energy on this side might fit as a function of time. Okay. And this deserves further explanation. So if you think about a superposition of two acetones, two uh, energy eigenstates, states, the wave function is written like this, and this is time evolving factor. Omega, of course, is the uh, corresponds to the energy of a two eigenstate E1 and E2. Now, in condensed space, we want to think with uh, density matrix. Okay, so if you use this to write down the density matrix, you have a four density matrix elements, two by two, four elements. Two of them are diagonal elements; they are called population. Two of them are off-diagonal elements; they are called coherence. Okay, so uh, some some. A form of a definition for quantum coherence is the refers to off diagonal density matrix elements. Now, this population is stationary. There is no phase evolution. They are stationary states, right? But this coherence has a phase evolution, phase oscillation term over there that corresponds to the energy difference over the two acetone states. This coherence effect of coherent uh, oscillation we will result in energy population moving reversibly wave-like energy transfer in the system from one to the other okay 
if you think of you know more biggest uh, setup, maybe you think about Ruby isolation. This is something like that. And normally or conventionally, this is very difficult to adopt. You, you, it's off diagonal. And if you use uh, assumption spectrum, you only, or for instance, spectrum, you only look at the diagonal populations. You don't see the off diagonal. Okay. You need some higher order nonlinear technique to see it. So actually, a, a technique called photon echo two dimensional uh, electronic spectroscopy can observe this kind of quantum beating signals. Now this is a basic setup of uh, 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 two-dimensional electronic spectroscopy. You need to send three pulses into your sample, and uh, and uh, measure a signal from a specific called uh, phase matching direction. Okay, and this electric field that you measure in your spectrometer uh, correspond to the third order response of a of your sample. So that's a kind of technical. But basically, you have three poles. You have three time delays, and you measure this in frequency domain. So you uh, uh, right away you have omega t here. You fix the population time, this time delay, and you can vary coherence time. You scan tau. After you scan tau, you have many many slices of uh, spectrum. You then fully transform them along tau, along this where you scan. Then you have a two frequency, omega tau and omega t. And this signal resolved at the uh, electric field uh, level gives you a two-dimensional spectrum. This 2D spectrum can be interpreted as such. You look at omega, omega tau as your input uh, frequency. So omega tau is basically uh, how you excite the system initially. And it correlates omega tau to omega t if you have a signal here means you excite here and you observe an output at this position. Okay. So you see at the diagonal, the spectrum gives you the position of those energy levels. Okay. If you have a stay over here, then you excite it and you see a signal coming out from it. You also have a state over here, actually over, all over the place here. Interestingly, if you see a close peak like this one, meaning you excite the system at a higher energy and then it emits at a low energy. Then if a chain, it must has an energy transfer event. So this technique is sensitive to energy transfer kind or the, to follow the evolution of your system. Lots of information in, 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 in it that I won't have time to explain to you. In around 2000, 2007, an um, experiment carried out in Graham Fleming's group, and I was in Graham Fleming's group at that time. Using 2D electronic uh, spectroscopy to observe or to measure the 2D spectrum of this complex called FMO complex that contains seven uh, cofield, uh, bacteria uh, cofields co actually, in it. And uh, this is a uh, 2D spectrum of this complex at uh, the population time equals to 200 femtoseconds, basically. If you look at this, there are not much information in there, but if you took a diagonal cup of this uh, 2D spectrum and line up this diagonal cut, so each of this is this corresponds diagonal wavelength, so this each is a diagonal cut of the spectrum at different de delay time, different uh, capital T, you see beating signals at the diagonal. And this beating signal, after that much uh, analysis and uh, theoretical uh, modeling support, was assigned to electronic coherence the oscillation of off-diagonal density matrix elements that I just mentioned. So this is from electronic, uh, electronic, electronic coherence. So this electronic coherence is lasting for more than uh, 660 uh, femtoseconds <coughs> corresponds to tells us some coherent with like any transfer in this system. And this paper was accepted and published on Nature and generated a huge amount of interest in a field because conventionally you will think in a protein it's a weight and warm environment then you shouldn't see any quantum effect but then at that time uh, through two-dimensional electronic spectroscopy a quantum coherence effect was uh, observed then at the same year we published another paper on